So we have a very special guest with us right now, a juror from the Lori Vallow Daybell trial. Tiffany is with us. Tiffany, thank you so much for coming here on Law and Crime. I really appreciate you taking the time. Now, let's be very clear. You were an alternate juror. You were not in the deliberation room for the final decision, but I have so many questions for you. My first question is, what was that like? You were sitting on a jury for a trial that was watched by the entire country, even internationally, people were watching it. What was it like to sit on that jury? It was an incredibly surreal experience. Um, I don't know, there was about 2,000 jurors that showed up and I, every day that I showed up, I was like, no, there's no way I would get picked. There's just no way. And, th and then it went down to 100 and then down to the 18 and then I was, a one of the last 18 standing. So it was just extremely surreal um, experience to be picked as one. And let's be clear, you didn't know anything about Lori Vallow Dable, anything about this case before you walked in there? Well, that was one of the questions that was on the questionnaire and also um, the prosecution and defense asked us in person um, in an in-person interview. So. I had told them that I did know a little bit about the case, but not a lot. Um, I don't typically watch the news. So uh, I knew a little bit. I knew who she was. I knew the crimes that were against her. But other than that, I hadn't watched any other news coverage. Well, it's a good thing you weren't watching Law and Crime then. That's the one time I say I'm happy you weren't watching us because uh, this is yeah, something. Yeah, sorry, no following. offense. I wasn't watching, hey, I wasn't watching no. any news. <laughs> That's a good thing. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been able to sit on that jury. Um, I am fascinated by that, though, because I, I'll be completely honest with you. If I was knew about this case beforehand, I don't think I'd be able to sit on that jury. I don't think I'd be able to be impartial. What? How were you able to say, you know what, I've seen things about it, but I'm able to make a, you know, be impartial and able to judge this case based on the facts and the law? I, well, I guess maybe it's my profession um, and my former experience in the military. I'm just a very neutral person. Um, I feel like everybody has a side to the story. I don't usually judge people right away. And since I didn't know a lot of facts or I hadn't seen any documentaries or I hadn't seen any news on her, I felt like I was going to be very impartial, even though... Um, I have a child um, that's Tylee's age. Um, so I knew that it was going to be difficult probably trying to be impartial um, to somebody, you know, where the children were murdered. But I do believe in the process um, that everybody deserves a fair chance um, and not be decided to be guilty without um, getting their fair trial in court. That's great to hear. I'm an attorney, and I, I think that's very commendable to hear. I'm always happy to hear that from our jurors, that they're able to you know, put aside any bias or prejudice or for past information and able to just hear what this case is about. When you were sitting on that jury and you were in that courtroom day in, day out, did you have any sense of how big of attention there was brought to this case? Did you understand or have a sense of the media attention, how many people were watching this case? Now, obviously, there were no cameras in the courtroom, but the audio was actually being played back on news outlets every day. Did you have an idea about how many people were invested in this case? Um, when I was in the process of it, when I was, the, it was like the final 18, somebody had mentioned that there was a documentary on Netflix about it. I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> I, this is a huge case for me to be a part of. Um, but I had, I had no idea that we were being, or the, the case was being recorded in court. I just knew that they didn't have any um, cameras in there, but I didn't know it was being recorded for the news media. And we were told that a majority of the people in the audience were journalists. So we were constantly checking you guys out. <laughs> well, you were, but, but, but like, how hard was it to not read anything about the case or talk about the case when you left every day? It was extremely difficult. Um, being a juror and being one of 18 and having to go back to our um, room that we were in and we were instructed not to be able to talk to anybody. And I, we couldn't talk to family members who might have been looking at the media, you know, like the, the news coverage of it. So it was extremely difficult. Just, just to kind of keep it all in and not being able to talk about it. Um, there was just many nights that I, I came home and 
was just crying and devastated and just not being able to get it out and talk about it to anybody. It was probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Yeah, I um I wanted to talk to you about that. I've been following the case since 2019 from the very beginning. Going into this trial, I knew a lot about it. But I'll tell you right now, there were things that were presented in that trial that we didn't know before. So, for example, we didn't know how Tylee and JJ were killed. We learned it the same the way that you did. When you're sitting in that courtroom and you're listening to those details and you're hearing these bizarre things about religion and the way these kids were killed, what did you think of that, hearing that for the first time? Well, exactly probably what you thought, <laughs> um, that this is just so bizarre. Um, I, most of the time, was looking at Lori Vallow um, to see how she reacted to evidence or re how she reacted to pictures or how she reacted to the video. So I looked at her probably 95% of the time just to see how she reacted to the information that was presented because I was shocked to just hear some of the things in you know, the phone calls and see the texts. Um, I, I just, and there was so much to it <laughs> that there's so much evidence to piece together that it was just so bizarre. I never knew that it was so complex, that there were so many criminal activities tied to this particular case. Yeah. And when Come you on. were watching, <laughs> no worries. When you were, when you were watching her, <laughs> did she make eye contact with you at all? What did you think of her behavior in court? Um, I felt like she did look at us a couple times, but, um, for the most part, she avoided eye contact. And I looked at her during some critical times where I felt like maybe I should have seen some emotion on her face, but I, I didn't see anything. I, it just felt like she didn't accept that, you know, the charges were against her, or maybe she still felt like that she was in some higher power that these charges, you know, didn't apply to her. I don't know, but she just seemed very unemotional for uh, most of the trial. Well, let's be clear. I, I was going to save this for the end, but I actually really want to know this right now. You were an alternate. You didn't get the ability to vote um, in this case. If you did sit in this jury room, if you had the ability to deliberate, you've had a, the ability to cast a vote, would you have convicted Lori Vallow-Daybell? I definitely would have. I mean, I think a majority of us, you know, at first I was disappointed that I didn't get to speak my voice, but I honestly feel that a majority of us um, felt the same um, over the five weeks that we had heard enough evidence to be able to, um, even before going to the jury room, that we were going to convict her, um, find her guilty on most of the charges. There was one charge that in particular that I might have needed to deliberate a little bit longer on, but um, for what the was that most one? part, I would have gone in there. That was the charge against Tammy Daybell. What was your hang up about that? Because I'll tell you from the outside, we were struggling with that as well. We were wondering whether or not the jury would convict her of conspiracy to commit the murder of Tammy Day, but we didn't know if there was enough there. What was your take on it? I I agree. I mean, I, I would have gone into the deliberation rooms and that would have probably been the one that I would probably want to talk about the most. Um, I felt pretty solid on the other charges, but the one on Tammy Daybell, I did not feel um, solid on. Like, I just don't feel that there was solid evidence uh for her um charge as opposed to the other charges do you think that chad is the one who killed her because that seemed to be what the prosecutors were suggesting i think he definitely had a, a heavier hand in it yes i do when when you did you think the the testimony about tammy you know where Lori uh said you know the night that someone tried to shoot tammy and Lori made these comments that uh she was on the phone with presumably Alex Cox and called him an idiot and seemingly that he, he missed his shot and uh, can't do anything right. And that she had said to Zulema Pastenis that, um, you know, Tammy was a dark spirit and that she was going to die. Did, did you, did that just wasn't enough for you to feel that she had a role in Tammy's death? I don't know if I, I don't say it would be enough. I would have just had to talk about it probably a little bit longer for that charge than other charges. I mean, there was information and evidence that supported their case about um, the Tammy Daybell charge, but it just wasn't as solid as the other charges.
So what was some of the testimony or evidence that really stood out to you and, and led you to believe that Lori killed her kids? Oh, boy. <laughs> There's a lot of information, uh, a lot of evidence that was provided for that one. Um, I think it was kind of what the prosecutor said at the end. It was a money motivator uh, that she learned her lesson with Charles Vallow um, that she didn't get his $1 million and she made sure um, it, it was seen premeditated that she made sure to um, transfer Tylee's um, funds into her account and just prepping for um, Tylee's death, I think. And also just the text messages. I think those were solid evidence as well that she was constantly asking, you know, uh, what the death percentages were for her kids and talking, you know, about evil spirits that they needed to be get, gotten rid of. Um, it was just clearly encouraging um, her brother, Alex Cox, to um, do some harm because they were that evil spirits in them. So Alex Cox, um, as I'm sure you know, uh, is dead um, and he's not going to be tried. So we'll, we'll never really know the no. full story. Do you believe he was the one who killed the kids? I do. Yes, I do. Um, his... I, I, from what I remember, there was so much evidence that there was uh, his palm prints or fingerprints on the bag. Um, there was consistent evidence that he was in the area. I mean, that's actually eventually how they found where the graves were um, be, because his cell phone um, on the cast report, his cell phones was pinging off towers exactly in the location that the grave sites were. So I do believe that he carried out um, Lori's orders. I do. That's funny you say, that's interesting you say Lori's orders. So the defense tried to make it seem almost that, you know, she didn't know what was happening and maybe it was Chad was the ringleader. Chad was the one who was controlling her. What did you think of that argument? Was there any, did you have any hesitation at any point saying, you know what, maybe Lori didn't know what was going on. There was one text message between Chad and Lori where she asked if there's a plan. Is there a well-orchestrated plan? And he seemed to say there is a plan. Did you think at any point that Lori might not know what's going on? Oh, boy. You're asking some tough questions. Um, I, I, these, I listen, believe- I've been following this case from the beginning, so I have, I'm so happy to talk to you right now about it. I do believe from what I heard from the evidence that she – encouraged her brother in multiple circumstances to commit crimes did she know exactly what happened to the kids i don't know i i knew that i do think that she knew that they were killed um probably to get rid of their evil spirit but do i think that she knows under what circumstances um where you know, how it was done. I don't know about that. Um, nothing was ever presented to us that gave us any inclination that she knew exactly what happened to them. Well, her hair being found on the duct tape that was wrapped around JJ, an argument could be, argument could be made she was there when he was ki- killed. Do you believe that? That one was hard. I do think the defense had a solid... Um, argument with that, um, that, you know, and a mother's hair could be found on clothing and that, you know, the bodily fluids could have possibly displaced it. I, I do think they had a solid argument against that hair. So that wasn't actually the hair itself was not a deciding, um, factor for me. I don't think. Well, well, it's interesting. You say that Lori might not have known exactly what happened, but you felt confident enough Um, If you would have gone into the deliberation room and obviously, you know, you would have had conversations and maybe your feeling would have been different. But to say that you would have found her guilty of first degree murder and conspiracy to commit the murder of the children, if walk me through that, what was it about the evidence that you said, you know what, even if she might not know of what known of exactly what happened to the kids, she murdered them. She was a part of that first degree murder. She she directed her brother. She was part of the plot. What what evidence led you there? Well, the judge made it extremely clear to us um, that we may not get the smoking gun, like that we're not going to get the um, the text, you know, from Lori that to kill my kids for me, Alex. Um, that 
we she didn't actually physically have to kill her kids for you know for her to be convicted of murder i just think that there was enough evidence circumstantial evidence that she planned it she encouraged it and saw it through and that to me um is what the judge had instructed us to look at you mentioned the text messages i I think those were pivotal Uh, my opinion was that's the closest we could probably get to that smoking gun although i will tell you and i'm curious your thoughts the phone calls the phone calls between chad and her son colby ryan and her sister summer shiflet what did you guys think of that oh boy um boy those were tough to hear really tough um so much emotion from her sister um from her son so much emotion and just zero emotion from her um saying that they're you know safe you know don't worry about it um i don't know it was just it was so bizarre that these people these family members that she's loved all of her life and she's had she has zero emotion on the phone with them and has stands by her her story i it was just so bizarre that she didn't give in and cry or just show any emotion to them at all. That that fact that she didn't show that emotion, and also, like you said, kind of in the courtroom not showing emotion, would that have guided your decision? I think it would have helped a little bit, maybe, just to see, you know, that maybe I was manipulated by Chad. You know, that... I don't know. Like, just having zero emotion about your kids missing or losing your um, living son. I mean, who... You're losing your relationship with him. You're you lo- losing your relationship with your sister. Like, I, I honestly think that a, a human being that thinks that they know that they've done wrong would have definitely showed more emotion than that. Just there's just so many people hurt by this. Yeah, and you're hearing about demons and dark spirits and death percentages and these you know religious figures and notions. I I'm still shocked at what I heard from that. What were you, what were you thinking when you heard about the, the religious indoctrin, indoctrination and and castings? What were you thinking about? <laughs> well, it sounded like a cult to me. I mean, but you know, the, the defense had a good point. You know, they only had six people or you know however many in their little cults. You know, so um. I just think that in this particular case, religion and their beliefs were used to manipulate people. And I know that can happen. Um, I'm very open about religion and people's religious beliefs, and I don't cast judgment on people. But um, when your religious beliefs and you start manipulating others, especially to do, you know, these violent crimes, you know, that's where I just don't, it's just bizarre to me. I just don't understand how somebody could reach that point. Did you think that it was Chad manipulating her into this at all? I do. Um, I do believe in the beginning when she met him, um, the the defense did mention that, you know, she was a loving mother and, you know, had a very normal life. Yes, she was part of the LDS church, um, which is no big deal. I mean, a lot of people, and especially in Boise, are part of the LDS church. But I do believe things changed for her. And... um, in October, I think it was October 2018, when she met him, that I do believe that he manipulated her into believing some certain ideas. And she, um, for some reason, um, joined him in those beliefs. By the way, I just want to go back to Tammy for a second, um, because you said you had some hesitation there. The prosecution presented the evidence that she and Chad got married two weeks after Tammy died that she was shopping for wedding rings before Tammy died. What did you think of that piece, those pieces of evidence? That was pretty damning evidence, to be honest with you. Like she's, you know, just shopping for wedding dresses and wedding rings and seemingly, seemingly planning for her new life before his wife died. So, I mean, that right there was evidence that she was also the manipulator ma- manipulator as well. I mean, I did see some texts between her and him that it seemed like she eventually manipulated him, um, asking him, you know, when is, you know, when is Tammy's death percentage going to get to zero? 
um, you know, kind of manipulating him through texts with asking, um, oh, you know, enjoy your family, you know, all the step out of the picture now. Um, those were def definitely manipulation tactics. And I think she used those against Chad um, to get what she wanted in the end. I want to talk about the defense a little bit. They didn't call any witnesses. They just focused their case purely on questioning the prosecution's witnesses, and they had a closing argument. What did you think of their case? Did they give you any moment of hesitation, any pause to think twice about what the prosecution was saying? Uh, <laughs> I... I was actually, I mean, I know that, the, I mean, that we get we given instructions that the defense never had to come up with witnesses or come up with a defense at all, really. We knew that from the beginning, but I was honestly very surprised that we at least didn't get some witnesses that supported that she might have been manipulated by Chad um, or some psych evaluation that might have helped uh, their defense. Would that have changed your opinion? Well, it depends on what the psych evaluation said, you know, right. I don't know, maybe, I mean, I, it's hard to speculate on something that I never got to, I never got to see any witnesses or defense. She didn't take the stand either. Now, jurors are not supposed to take that into their consideration when they render a verdict, but you know, the fact that she chose not to testify, uh, what'd you think about that? Um, that's actually one of the juror questionnaires, like or the, or the questions on the questionnaire was, do we think um, the defendant should have to testify? And I mark no. I, I feel like any person who is being on the stand and being interrogated might slip up, you know, even if they didn't commit a crime. I just don't know. Not everybody can say what they mean and mean what they say when they're being interrogated on the stand. So I wasn't surprised that she didn't take the stand. Would there have been anything that she could have said that maybe would have changed your opinion? I mean, if she came on the stand and threw her brother under the bus and threw Chad under the bus, how would that have related to you? It might have. I, I, again, I'm just speculating like what she would have said, you know, if, if she had said I felt manipulated by him, that I never gave any orders to um, cause harm to my kids, you know, that causing harm to my kids was taken out of context by my brother. I mean, anything might have helped her, I think. Would I have changed my mind? I don't know. I mean, again, it's just speculating based on something that just didn't happen. So do you think the defense didn't do a, a, th a great job? You think that they could, they could have done more um, and maybe, maybe they, it was like a missed opportunity a little bit? Well, I guess I, I, I think about the Casey Anthony trial um, and I relate it to a little bit to that. Not a lot, but I mean, I just do feel like maybe that's what I was expecting, you know, because I did know about the Casey Anthony trial and her defense putting on a, you know, great defense for her. So, yeah, I'm, I was expecting a little bit more than what we were offered. Although their closing arguments, I just feel it was like a little too late. It's interesting you say that. That's what we were saying on air, too. Is it a little too little too late with what they were saying? Yeah. I do, I do yeah, want to like talk to you. They should have probably said some of that a long time ago. <laughs> Jeez. That's fair. That's fair. Um, I do want to talk to you about what I believe I think a lot of us would agree, was probably the most difficult day. And that was finding out what happened to JJ and Tylee. Um, seeing those images of them and understanding how they died, I can imagine that was an incredibly difficult day. What was that day like for you? Oh, boy. Um, I We had already seen... You know, JJ, everything beforehand, we'd already seen some pictures of JJ's burial, um, him being, you know, uh, unearthed, you know, with the, um, whatever that team is, the evidence recovery team. So I personally didn't think that we would have to go through the autopsy pictures, you know, cause it was pretty much the same pictures except, um, just removal of the tape and the, the bag and whatnot. But, um, that was 
the hardest day for me. I, I couldn't even, I mean, I just cried. I tried to hide my tears a lot because I know we weren't supposed to show emotion. And yeah, it, it was incredibly disturbing that somebody would do that to um, two kids. I, and, and I would come home to my teenage daughter and just cry, you know, and she would just hold me and give me a hug. And there was one day I saw um, a kid like walking in the grocery store, you know, with his pajamas on and his like, his bare feet. And I just came home and I just cried. That, like how somebody could do something just, you know, the children like that. Just, it's pure evil. It really is. Um, and, you know, I, I always said this because I was uh, and I was following the case. I said I just I felt really bad for you guys because you shouldn't have to see that. And, and you know, jury service, jury duty is just incredibly hard as is. But to see that, I really, really felt bad for all of you um, that you were exposed to that that level of detail and had to witness that. And I'm sorry that you had to see that. Um, and I just, I, I know that must've been incredibly difficult. We had our reporters who were talking about how difficult it was for them. Um, when you were watching that, did you get angry? Did you, did, did you feel like you wanted justice for the children? Um, because I mean, it's hard to separate it. it you, everybody's human. Seeing that you, you get angry. I would. I mean, of course, you know, any normal human being or parents, I mean, most of us on the jury were parents. I mean. You would be just evil inside if you didn't have any kind of um, emotion or reaction to that. You know, you want to give them justice. Those kids need justice to what happened to them and because they no longer can speak for themselves. And, you know, I think somebody needed to, and Lori in particular, um, needed to um, be held responsible for it. How do you think Lori perceived her children at the end of the day? Because she at one point was seemingly a loving mother and then this. I mean, wh wh what do you think she thought of them? How do you think she justified this? I, I have no, I mean, I have zero answer for that. I really don't. I don't know how any parent could justify um encouraging somebody um to murder their child encouraging somebody to there's a you know evil spirit in them that must be get, gotten rid of um how somebody a, a parent could n I lie to numerous people about where your kids are while you're off enjoying you know multiple vacations in hawaii it's just it's not what a normal parent would do do you think that it was all about the money? It was all about her relationship with Chad? Or do you think that it was something more? I think it was just a storm, a whirlwind of things um, just collided in October 2018 when they got together. That um, it was part religious belief that they... Um, thought that the, they were higher powers, that they were going to be the last people standing on this earth. Um, that was one aspect of it. And I do honestly believe that money um, had a lot to do with it as well, because I'm sure as you heard during the trial that there was numerous people who would have taken the kids. Yep. Um, you know, if she had problems with them, if she thought were they were evil spirits or they were, you know, JJ had special needs. And it was incredibly hard for her. Then she had numerous people that she could have asked to take the kids. And that's where I do feel that the financial gain came into play. That she it, knew that if the kids went somewhere else, that the money would follow them. It's it's such a it's such a tragedy that aspect because they could have lived. They Chad and her could have you know, moved on and, and started a life. That's one of the heartbreaking aspects of it. I wanted to ask you, we have, I know we have a couple minutes left. Um, so much evidence was presented about Charles Vallow. You and the rest of the jury were not tasked with deciding whether or not she was involved in his murder. I don't know if you know this, but Lori Vallow is charged with Char with conspiracy to commit the murder of Charles Vallow out in Arizona. Based on what was presented in this courtroom, do you think that she plotted to kill Charles Vallow? 
Oh boy, that's a hard question for me to answer because I didn't have all the evidence um, to that case. And I, and I don't know the legalities of them being able to tell us what happened in Arizona because I do feel like we got bits and pieces of it, but not the full story. So that would be hard for me to um, be able to make a, any judgment on. That's fair. Let me ask you this. If Alex Cox and Chad Daybell were also being tried um, at, in your courtroom and you had to decide whether or not they were responsible, they were guilty of the murders of the kids and Tammy Daybell based on what was presented to you, do you think that you would have had enough evidence to convict Alex Cox and Chad Daybell? Oh, yes. They were all three um, working together. I mean, it, and it's unfortunate, Alex, that I feel like he was the pawn. And even in the message, or when he talked to Zulima Pastenas, that he was the fall guy. I, I honestly that believe that they manipulated him so much that he um, did anything that they said. And he was a warrior for, war, for Lori. And... Yeah, but unfortunately, just being manipulated by somebody doesn't get you off the hook. So I, I do believe, honestly, that th all three of them would be found guilty. You, um, you mentioned that in the middle of the trial, um, you were feeling that you would vote in favor of guilt. How did you, you said you were feeling the most of the jurors were feeling that same way. H how did you know that? It, it, was it just a feeling from them where there's any sort of conversations? Well, it's been conversations that we've had after. Um, but during that time, yeah, I mean, we weren't allowed to say anything to each other. And we didn't. We actually were. Uh, we went to our room and we ate all that food and we didn't say anything to each other. But I could get the feeling that a lot of us felt the same way, you know? Yeah. Were you, uh, were you incredibly... I mean, the emotions on the jury, you know, just, I mean, I could see other jurors crying and... So just the emotions are in just their facial expressions. I can see that, you know, they also probably maybe felt the same way that I did. Were you disappointed that you weren't part of the uh, jury deliberation process? I was, I mean, I knew in the beginning that there was going to be six alternates. Um, I do feel that I, you know, I didn't get my say, but I do feel that my fellow jurors um, deliberated how I would have deliberated um, and, 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 um, come up with the not, uh, the guilty verdicts as well. So I do feel like that. Not my, not that my voice was heard, but I do feel like a majority of us thought the same way. And um, yeah, I mean, it came out in the verdict that I would have come out with. So and, it and was disappointing. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I can imagine you sit through the whole trial and then you don't even get to decide uh, one way or another. Um, but, you know, I appreciate you letting us know which way you were leaning and, and where you were going to go. Um, the one last thing I want to ask you about is in the text messages, there was a lot of sordid details between Chad and Lori and their love affair. I'm just curious what you thought of those because they're communicating. They're both having affairs. That we know that the kids are, 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 they're planning to kill the kids and the kids would eventually die. What did you think of their communications back and forth about their love affair? Well, it was just so odd to me, so odd that, you know, that they got all these burner phones. I mean, they had like, it seemed like six phone numbers a piece. It was so hard to keep track of how many phone numbers that they had and, it was so odd that they had this love connection and that divorce was never, I'm sorry, my nose itches. <laughs> that no. divorce was never an option. Like the rest of us normal human beings were divorce your, if this is the love of your life, then just divorce them. Or, you know, divorce your husband or wife and then go on and live your life happily with the person who you think that you're with. Um. And, I just think and, that they both related themselves to these higher powers and the prophet and his wife and that they were married in prior creations um, and that they believed it. And one of the saddest things is Tammy was none the wiser. You know, she didn't know about the affair. She was very much in love with Chad. It wasn't his ex-wife or his divorce wife. She was very much married to him, and this just happened to her. Um, before I let you go, Tiffany, I just want to know if you had any final thoughts about what this experience has been like and what you're going to take away from it. Well, 
I think for one, it was extremely interesting to be part of this process. Um, I've always been, uh, you know, not picked for juries because I had hardships. So I love seeing our justice system at work and to be part of it. Um, even though I wasn't the final decision maker, um, part of the 12, I, it really helps me know that this process does work. The last thing that I think um, the investigators um, who investigated this, and there was a lot of them, um, really, really did a great job. They really did. Um, and without their evidence and their investigation, this this trial, it would have never been, I think she would have never been found guilty without their investigation. Sorry, Tiffany, I lied. I had one last question I wanted to ask you. Do you have a theory as to as to actually how these killings were carried out? Because, you know, there was, the defense said, you know, they, the prosecution doesn't even really know what Lori's role in was all this. Do you, do you have a theory as to how exactly uh, uh, J.J. and Tyler were killed and how Tammy was killed and, I, you, you know, in terms of when and how and who did what? The only evidence, and well, we received evidence. Oh my gosh, I'm without my notes here. It's really hard sure. for me to answer that question. But um, I do feel that, especially with the burial of JJ, um, one of my main questions was that Alex Cox was um, there on his property for a very short time, um, which to me was indicator of somebody else helping him because that grave that was dug and what that he was buried in was extremely meticulous which would have taken more than the time that alex cox was there so i do feel like jj's um death some he had help and i don't know who that was but i can probably guess um tylee that was just a different story i mean she was just so there was just hardly any uh, just evidence, I guess, of her death and what happened to her. So it's just really hard to know that. And like you said, with Tammy, there was, uh, you know, he's, he's Chad's facing his own trial with respect to Tammy Daybell. He's actually charged with her murder. Um, Tiffany, yeah. thank you so much for taking the time. I know this wasn't easy revisiting this case. Um, but we really do appreciate it. And and also, thank you for your service. Um, jury duty, duty, as I said, is never easy, particularly in cases like this. So um, I know everybody thanks you for what you did. All right. Thank you so much.